That's kind of scary. All right, uh, is that too loud in the back or? Okay, if it works for you all, it works for me. <laughs> all right, uh, let's kick on through here. And all right. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and start now because we've got uh, Elixir by the belly full. There is a whole lot of content packed into this talk. And so uh, I'll do my best to make it through. I've got my stretchy pants on. I hope you all do. You've just finished up your meal. And so here we're going to go. Um, so uh, here's me on Twitter. There's uh, FNConf17. And uh, if any of you are new to Elixir, this is the way you tell the Elixir community what you're up to. You say, my Elixir status here. And so that's uh, the way you say hi. So let's begin. Um, so when we come to a new language, out of the room, how many of you are Elixir developers already? OK, how many Erlangers in here? OK, a lot of Erlangers. That's awesome. And people that are brand new to it. All right, perfect. OK, so anytime we come to a new stack, there are all sorts of questions we have. We're wondering, it's like, what are the things I don't even know? You know, I, I know these things I don't know about. And then there are other things, it's like, I don't even know that I don't know those things. And so. In this whole process, we're out there scouting. We're out there looking, and we're looking for where the dangers are, where the sea monsters are, and where uh, pitfalls and so on. But we're also looking where the fun is. There, there may be things that are fun out there that are good that we just don't know about yet. And so this talk, we're going to try to hit as many of those things as possible. And so we've got this kind of list here. These are kind of big, high-level things that I've been asked about specifically. I'm curious, uh, is there something on here you don't know a whole lot about? Uh, show of hands. Like, is there something on here that maybe you haven't bumped into yet? OK, all right. And so, good. We'll jump on in then. So a beginning, uh, we'll go ahead and start with the history here of how we got to this whole Elixir thing. Uh, so we have Jose Valim who was a core member of the Ruby on Rails team. And so he was facing uh, serious challenges around concurrency, around scalability, around performance on Ruby. But that's not just specific to Ruby. There are a lot of people that are having those kinds of problems in other stacks. So, <clears throat> but Jose, he's in this interesting position being this core member of this team. And so he's out there. He's always curious. He's always out there scouting. And in 2011, uh, he's been reading Seven Languages in Seven Weeks by Bruce Tate. Have any of you read that book? OK, great. And so when, when Jose grabbed the book, it lit him on fire when he got to this chapter, the Erlang chapter. And he, it, it says, OK, every problem that I'm having day to day, it looks like these guys are solving these problems. And so that's good. So question, why is it that he didn't just become an Erlang developer? Why did he, well, he really did become an Erlang developer. He's probably written more Erlang code than any of us, <laughs> except for maybe Francesco or Robert. Uh, if he, he's in here. But outside of that, he's written a devil a lot of Erlang code now. So why is it that he didn't just move over and become an Erlang developer? And so some people might think syntax, and that's really not the right answer. That isn't why he did this. It had to do with these other bits, and we'll be talking about a lot of those. But it comes down to the tool chain and the community. And so rather than jumping ship and leaving that community, he thought it would make a lot more sense to bring that community along. Now, the other thing is, why didn't he just steal the good parts of Erlang, the things that he was missing, steal those ideas and bring them back over to Ruby? And so we'll see why that didn't happen and why in 2014, after three years of work, he gets V1 and he brings this whole community into the Erlang VM, into this ecosystem. Francesca is taking a picture. So. <laughs> All righty. So the big question comes down to the why Erlang. And we can start off with, with that one here on um, this old crusty phone that some people over here uh, recognize. So at Ericsson, uh, the Swedish telecom giant, they had problems back in the 80s that most companies are just now having. They had to deal with massive concurrency. They had to deal with high availability and all these sort of web scale things. We have all sorts of buzzwords for the things that they were dealing with back then. And so we move on into what happened at Ericsson. So you've got this group here. You've got Joe, Robert, and Mike. 
And they were in the computer science lab, and they were, they were focused on these problems of telecoms, these problems that Ericsson was dealing with. Like, what do you do to have high availability? What do you do to make sure you've got 100,000 phone calls, that you don't do something that just drops 100,000 phone calls? Because if you remember, before cell phones came along, phones were reliable. People expected them to work. And so the standards have changed, but back then they were expected to work, and if they didn't, it was bad. And so here, I uh, got these guys, they're solving these general problems in telecom. So the first one, high availability. So well, Ericsson, they had money, and they bought carrier grade equipment. Carrier grade is this idea of five nines. And so they'd spent the money on that. But still, if you have perfect hardware, still things go wrong. Sometimes the perfect hardware fails. Sometimes the environment gets weird. Sometimes your code messes up. You know? And so you have all these problems. So if you want to have high availability, you really be, need to be able to tolerate faults. And so that was the number one goal of what these guys were working on. There's like, how do we build fault tolerant software? And they had models that they were using, uh, uh, the research that had come before and all this, but they knew that this was essential of being able to, when you hit a fault, to be able to recover from it. And so if you have the 100,000 phone calls that you're dealing with, <coughs> you have this problem of concurrency. And you need to be able to have things fail in isolation. Because if you have one big process, and you have all 100,000 phone calls there, and you've done something jacked up in your code, or there's some environmental weirdness, and it leaks, and you try catch into a weird spot, the whole thing falls down, you've lost all your calls. Terrible, terrible. And so you need to be able to have uh, this isolation between things and have them fail independently, and also be able to have, if this thing fails, have something else bring it back before anyone notices. That's really nice. And then two, you've got a big code base. You want to have this really nice concurrency model that where, you know, who thinks threading and thinks, oh, this is going to be easy? You know, no one. No one raises their hand on that because it's not going to be easy. But here, the goal was to make sure that concurrent programming was easy. And so in Erlang, Elixir, we code sequentially. We code top to bottom. Everything is just me. And I don't have to think about outside other than through message passing. So concurrency, win. Okay? So you've got your box. It's running. It's perfect. Everything's great. The code's great. You're on good hardware. You've got concurrency down. You've got this fault tolerance thing built up. You don't really have your fault tolerance thing built up because what happens? The server catches on fire. All your calls are down. Again, so we have to have distribution on top of that. And so this is, uh, came a little bit later, but these primitives were there from the beginning on what would allow the distribution to happen. So you have multiple servers, one falls down, you keep on churning. And so that's the space that we're in. And on the maiden voyage of, of Erlang going out into the world, this is the one, uh, we replace our one through nines with all nines because uh, the XD301 switch, this maiden voyage, goes out to British Telecom and the, the, the lore and the legend is this thing hits nine nines of uptime out there. So 30 milliseconds of downtime a year is what that number means, which is absolutely stunning. And it wasn't expected. <laughs> and so, and this is news to the whole world then, and after it was open sourced, people uh, that were building things that also need to be reliable jumped onto the stack because there weren't alternatives and there still are not alternatives. And so this is an interesting thing. So why is it? How does it even happen? Why is this 9.9 thing going on? It comes down to this. This is the most important thing, the Erlang VM. And this is why Jose didn't uh, rip off uh, things and just bring them over to the Ruby community. And so Erlang VM, so what is it? So if we look here, we've got uh, in context, we have over here the operating system that it might run on. So Windows, Linux, Mac, and we've got this stack. So we have the uh, Erlang runtime system, Erlang VM, and the bits there. And up on top of that, we have OTP and Elixir, uh, Erlang, list flavored Erlang. So notice something funny about this. A lot of times when you see a stack like this, you see the runtime would be up on top of the operating system. This thing is way down into the belly of this, uh, uh, this, this box on the bottom here, and that's because Erlang is an operating system. And that's an interesting thing for us to get our head around, and we're going to be talking about that as we go forward. But, so you've got this operating system that's at the bottom, and on top of it you have these patterns that get cooked into OTP that uh, the, the gang was working on from the 80s on of making these patterns that, uh, to build reliable software on top of these primitives that were exposed by the Erlang VM, 
And up on top, we have these languages that all compile down to the beam, so the binary format. This number here is part of why companies don't come along and just beat Erlang at being Erlang. Because this VM here was built for the things that it does really well, and it's had a lot of time by a lot of really smart people put into it. This is why Jose didn't just, you know, ruby up. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, there's an interesting thing over here. Look at the none. I've got a pointer here. I can do this, I guess. Can I? Yeah, there's none. That's pretty neat. So the none, we can have bare metal Erlang. And so here we have uh, a slide showing zerg, erlangonzen.org. And what this thing is, is uh, so they, they have taken a version of Erlang and they've, they've targeted bare metal. They're bare metal against the Zen hypervisor. And so what we're seeing here in this demo screen is a request came in. So this is from my browser. I did a screen capture of this. I sent in a request to this site. They spin up a brand new instance on EC2. They boot it into Erlang. Bare metal Erlang on the Zen hypervisor. They load up a web server. And they take my request, they service my request, they do all the Django template stuff in there, and then they send the results back with the timings and so on. And this all happens in 0.3 seconds, and the machine is gone and dead and shut down, all in that 0.3 seconds there. Absolutely stunning. And you'll also see these other interesting things. Uh, uh, you could see Erlang User Conference, I believe, uh, the fellows behind GRISP, there are probably talks recorded uh, there that you can go ahead and check about where bare metal fits here. And then, if you're into this whole thing, Go off and check out Nerves Project. Super cool. OK, so operating system, we're talking about this world of being an OS. What does it even mean to be an OS? So you have to think about process management. And you have to think about interrupts and memory management. You have to think about file I.O., network I.O., and so on. And what is it you have to think about in your code? Like, what is it that C, C Sharp, JavaScript, and so on, what is it that they think about? Well, their job is to eat brains. Brains, brains, brains. And so their whole job is to eat as much core as they can. They've got their zombie hands and they're pawing at the core. And the, in the process, the OS knows it cannot trust your code. It hates your code. It knows that you're out to get it and you can't keep your zombie grabby hands off of it, off the core. And so it can't trust you and it's doing all of this locking down of memory every time it tries to grab the talking stick away from you. And it's, it's a hostile relationship here. As we move over to the Erlang VM, we have something that's a lot healthier. We've got um, a cooperative system here. And this cooperative system is it, possible, not because it knows that you're all Erlang Elixir developers and you're good people. You are, but that's not why it trusts you. It trusts you because it knows you can't do anything wrong. It set the constraints on the language, and the language is completely cool with that because it's getting something good out of the bargain. It's getting all this, all this stuff we were talking about about the, uh, the, the fault tolerance, concurrency, and the distribution. And so nothing can cheat. There's no sort of half way of doing things here. And so as a result of that, we, we have massive improvements over what you would get, say, with thread context switching, where in your C code, it wants to grab core, grab core, grab core. The, the OS is saying smack, smack, smack. And you have tens of thousands of CPU operations every time you have a thread context switch. We don't have that here. And so we'll see about why in a bit. So let's start off. Uh, our first bit of Elixir here is going to be inside of the shell. So interactive Elixir, this is the most powerful tool in the Elixir toolbox, IEX. And we come in, we see Erlang OTP, and we see interactive Elixir here. And we're going to type in self. So self, we get this process ID back. This is the process ID of our REPL here, of our, of our interactive shell. And so it's processes all the way down. Everything in Elixir, you're not sometimes in a process. You're always in a process. And you're always talking to other processes. You don't flip into this mode of actor mode. OK, so concurrency, there's an interesting thing here. It, it's sometimes hard to get your head around what the word means, because it gets misused a lot of times. But concurrency is not equal to parallelism. These are different concepts. It's about concurrency is about the structure of lots of things at once. And parallelism is about the execution of many things at once. And so this is 
an interesting thing to keep in mind in the context of when Erlang was created. The Erlang VM was built. So in 86, they didn't have to think about multi-core. <laughs> it just wasn't a problem. Uh, you had, uh, it was, you know, you're happy to have a single core. And, and so that wasn't why the concurrency there. We've already talked a bit about the why there. But there's this interesting line here. We go from 86 to 06. At 20 years, so in 06 is when they said, hey, let's flip on multi-core. So updated uh, the Erlang VM, hooked up the schedulers and said, hey, why don't we run a scheduler on each core? And interesting thing happened. Code that had been written, good Erlang code that had been written before, uh, could now be ran on two cores, and it ran twice as fast. Four cores ran four times as fast. And in 2011, I think there was a study where up to 40 cores, they saw linear scale, which is just mind-boggling. You look at this, this whole, all this stuff was just built in from 86. It's a moonshot. It's absolutely just stunning. I mean, it just makes you want to just hug the guys. Okay, so here we are. We're going to go in and we're going to now look at the idea of the actor model, which you hear from every other stack, but you know, processes. So the props of every actor, of every process, we've got these things that they all come with. So each Erlang VM process, each Elixir process, has its own dedicated, isolated memory. And so uh, one kilobyte, or on 64-bit, you get two kilobytes that are allocated to start off with, and it can grow following a Fibonacci series as you need more and more storage. Say so you take more messages, you're doing things, you're holding more state. But this memory is yours, and no one can go in and wiggle your state and change it. No one actually can even reach in there and read your state. That's really powerful. And so there's a, um, oh, stack, heap. Um, that ends up being a pretty nice thing if you're a garbage collector. So you've got this functional programming language where st things are immutable. You change things, you can't, uh, you, you set a value, you can't change it. You have immutable values. And you have no one sticking their paws in your memory. So as a GC, it's a pretty good place to be, a uh, garbage collector. And so did they just do this as a trick writing, see if they could do it because they're awesome and all this? Well, they did it really around that fault tolerance uh, thing we were looking at earlier, because what happens on the JVM, you have a server humming along, it's servicing requests, you're just busy, 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 and everything's great, memory is starting to build up a little bit, but yeah, you're all right, and then you need to do GCs, but you keep on putting that, because you're still pretty busy, and you need to service these requests, and then you have the stop the world GC. And then things aren't so great, things queue, and then the whole world gets in a nasty place. So here, we have these, I, these dedicated garbage collectors per process. And so you think about these tiny little GCs that are happening, these deterministic GCs coming along on each process. So that's pretty sweet. No stop the world GCs there. Okay, we move on over to uh, this other prop that they all have, and this is the mailbox. And it's a good thing they have a mailbox because it's the only way that a process can talk to the outside world. So you can send a message to another process, and that other process can, can wait. Can, it doesn't have to do anything with the message. It just shows up in its mailbox. It's there. And whenever they feel like it, they can fall into a receive block and catch that message. Okay? And it's a good thing that there's this message passing because it's the only way that you can talk to the outside world. And I really mean it's the only way. Even so you would have this idea, it was like, well, sure, I can talk to the file system. I can call the file module and do this. You're doing message passing then. Because what you're doing when you do like file I.O. is you're saying, file module, I'm going to talk to your client API, and I'm going to ask the client API to go read a file, to write a file. That then talks to a gen server, which on the back is another process. And you're really just sending messages to that other process. An interesting thing, so often other FP communities there's a lot of talk around side effects, and you don't hear that really mentioned too much on the Erlang side or in the Elixir side, but it, we have a really good story there. And this is that if you're doing any sort of I.O., you kind of are doing something in, in a similar vein to what happens with the I.O. monad in the Haskell community, these things that, that, that are known to provide safety. So what we do instead on the Erlang VM is we have port drivers. So anytime we're talking to the outside world, that's all happening in the C code. 
that's a port driver, that C code looks to the world, looks to the rest of us as if it were just an Erlang process out there. But it's where we're poking state on the network, and we're wiggling things on the network, we're wiggling things on the file system, we're wiggling things on the console. That's where our I.O. happens. So how about those side effects? Um, and links and monitors, this is another bit of, uh, of gear that's on each process. So we can, set up, um, we can set up a link, which is a bi-directional death pact. And so this is, if you die, I'm going with you. You know, I can't make it alone. And so this is this relationship you have with this other process. These two, they're ganged together. They're Thelma Louise, they're going off the bluff together. And so uh, another way of doing this would be through monitors. This is unidirectional. It's more like reading the obituaries. It's not like you don't care. It's like, I want to know that you died, but I'm just not going with you. And so, and that's what, that's what monitors are about. And so we'll see both of these, all these primitives are used as we build up on top of this. Alrighty. So, process scheduling on the Erlang VM. We have a single CPU core. We have a single scheduler. Got three processes up here. And the way this works, rather than the thread context switching and the slap in hands and all this, instead, we have a sane model, this trusted model, where the scheduler is going to give each one of these processes 2,000 wax at the core. And so these wax we're going to call reductions. And so each one of these you can sort of think of as like a function call, or, uh, uh, roughly. And so, so we go through here, this process gets 2,000. Immediately we move the talking stick to the second process, churn, 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 third process. And there's almost zero cost between these because it's not like it had to shut, pin anything down. It was just like, I'm processing this, I'm moving out of this, I'm moving out of this, and I'm back to the first. Here's a visualization that shows the same thing, but this is much prettier. Uh, and this is actually a PowerPoint animation, which is just crazy. Uh, uh, so, and so we can have, if we have two cores, we get two schedulers, and we have that same sort of thing happening, and so on. So another idea that builds up on that links and monitors is, uh, is we have supervision. And so we talked earlier about if something goes wrong, we want to be able to, if it dies, we want to be able to bring it back. So this is kind of how this works. So we have a worker. Something weird goes on in the environment, it crashes, supervisor brings it back, and assuming it was just a Heisen bug, assuming it was just something in the environment, everything will churn back, that process is restarted to, its, uh, to a known good state. Okay. On top of that idea, we build up with uh, supervision trees and so on, we'll talk about it in just a bit. Okay. So say we have three processes here, we've got our core scheduler. Okay, this process is getting its turn. This one's getting its turn, and he falls into a receive block and says, I'm done with what I was doing. I'm just waiting for a message. Anyone have a message for me? And it's like, nope, there's no message in my message box. So at this point, he's, uh, he said, okay, I'm going to block now. Forever and ever, I'm going to block waiting for a message. So did we just ruin the whole show? Did this whole Erlang thing just turn out to be like, oh, that was not really such a great idea after all, because this guy's blocking. Is it killing everything? This is not Node.js. This is the Erlang VM. And we're elixirists, we're alchemists. And so what instead happens is this process, it falls under C block. The operating system, or Lang VM, knows that this process doesn't have a message. So it goes ahead and takes it out of the scheduler rotation, moves it over to the side, lets it go to sleep, and we move on to servicing this other one. At the point that the operating system, or Lang VM, knows that it has a message, it'll bring it back into the scheduler rotation. So you can think about this. You have hundreds of thousands of processes running. Your core might be sitting at zero or one percent because they're all in a receive block, just waiting for something to to uh, send to them. So uh, this is a common thing. It's such a strange thing to see. You've got sixty thousand processes going, and the cores are just sleeping, and uh, it's just beautiful. And so, um, okay, let us move on and talk about how uh, how we get from processes to diff different cores and to different schedulers. So we're gonna talk about this game of balancing and compaction here. Okay, so we're going along, we're busy, we're busy, we're not that busy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work steal, let this guy go be sleepy and save power. Okay, have the opposite problem over here. This one's getting a little too much loaded up on him, and so we're going to say, yeah, I don't have anything to do. And so he's going to work steal, and he's going to migrate these over. And this happens just as part of the, of the whole rotation. This is just a deterministic pattern that just happens, and this is all by the Erlang VM for us. We don't have to think about this, but it's really cool to know that it's all happening for us and how some of this stuff works. And so maybe if you came in 
alchemist, you're, you're playing around, you came from the Ruby community, somewhere like that, and, but you didn't understand this, maybe this gives you uh, like a firmer footing now and you feel more comfortable on the Erlang VM. But from those things we get massive concurrency, preemptive multitasking, soft real time, low latency over raw throughput. So that last one is really interesting because I don't know of other languages that, that value low latency over the raw throughput. So we're not so concerned about this process of uh, this, this one over here, how fast it can calculate pi. We're wanting to make sure that everyone gets the even deterministic uh, grab at the stick. And so, uh, and so no one gets to hog. Okay. We'll talk about uh, a line from Mike Williams where he talks that the performance of a concurrent language is predicated by three things. Context switching time, message passing time, and the time to create a process. And so this is a little demo uh, uh, have that basically proves Mike Williams, his, his idea of fast concurrency, that uh, Elixir has it, okay? So we have this thing that's gonna come in and it's gonna say live a full life. And to live a full life, we're gonna take some number of generations that are gonna come after you. And we're gonna take the original processes, process ID. We're gonna take that and we're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna spawn a brand new process. And I'm gonna spawn a brand new process that's the same process that I'm in, the live a full life, but I'm gonna pass it how many more minus one. And I'm gonna thread through that initial runner PID. Okay, so we spawn that brand new process and we have created a child then. We're gonna send the child an okay message. Then we're gonna go down and fall into a receive block waiting forever and ever and ever until someone sends us an okay message, which is of course gonna be our parent, right? Because our, uh, we, our, we send our child the okay message. And so this stack, it shows the message passing time. Uh, it, shows, it shows all of the bits from, from what Mike was talking about, the context switching time. And let's see what this looks like. So we do this with a million. And on this laptop, I time this at 1.1 second or 1.2 seconds uh, rounded. And so very, very fast, so if you've thought about like, I don't know, it may be a little heavy to bring up another process for this. It's not too heavy. You can go ahead and just bring up another process. It's, uh, so if you can bring up a million of them that go through this whole chain, uh, it's good. All right, OTP. We're gonna talk about uh, safety and fault tolerance here. So gen servers are where you do your work. Uh, as an alchemist and Gen servers though, a lot of people come to it and they're like, I use this thing, I don't completely understand this thing though. And so we're gonna take a little bit of a dive to try to, uh, to, to remedy that. So we're looking here at a gen server, we're gonna call this thing Chunko Worker. And really it's just a, a counter. We're gonna bump a counter. We have our one client, uh, client API bit on here that says uh, bump level. It's gonna take a PID and it's gonna tell how much to bump by. And that's all it does. So this is maybe still a little thick to read if you're, uh, if you're new to Elixir. So let's get another view of this for just a second. Let's see what we actually have here. We have code, we have this module, um, uh, the chunk of worker, but we also have some other code. We have the code that's in IEX. We're actually gonna call this. This is our client in this case, uh, just the shell. And then back in the back, we have gen server, and then gen server and gen. And so those, the ones at the bottom are the ones that Robert and Joe and Mike and Francesco built. Uh, and then gen server is the wrapper that Elixir puts onto it to take away some of the pain. And so, uh, because those guys weren't as focused on dev joy, they were focused on servers that ran forever. And uh, uh, that's what Jose brought in the dev joy side of things. And so we have gen server here. So let's look at this module, this stack on the left. This is our code. And the thing on the right is our process. So these are different concepts. You can have a single module and you can spawn a million processes off that one module. And you could also have uh, dozens and dozens of modules that are all running in the space of one process. And so these are separate concerns, separate ideas entirely. So let's map through here. So we're on our module. We're going to start our chunk of worker. That start in there is going to call start link back on our gen server. Our start link is then a go back to our callback function inside of our chunk of worker. And you see over here we have two processes. We've got this one over here, the initial one. And when we called over to our gen server start link, we ended up with this other one here. And so as we chunk on through, uh, our init is gonna set our initial state for the thing, and then we return back to the caller. So with that view of, of what was going on the messaging, now let's look at it with the code, and let's look at it a little bit bigger. 
Okay, so we have our bump level, our API, and we've started link. So our gen server is just sitting here in the server loop that's forever and ever going to just tail call itself. It's a loop, and it's going to do some things, and it's going to call back into itself, and that's how all the servers work. And so here we fall into our receive block. We're just waiting for someone to do something. Our client comes along and says, gen server call, bump, buy an amount. We receive that message, and we, and we gen server, uh, dispatches it back to your callback, where you do a handle call. You do your awesome business logic of bumping this amount up. And at the end of it, you're going to return your answer back to the caller, and you're going to update uh, with your new state. So that comes back. We send our reply, gen server sends our reply, back to the uh, caller, send reply, updates the state, and then we fall back into our loop again. And so this was uh, sort of a two or three angles of you know, the butcher's view of a gen server. And so uh, other things in OTP, we have applications, and this is where we're going to bring up a group of things together that need to be started together and stop together. Their life cycle is together. And so we can have many applications that orchestrate back and forth. This application can depend on this one and so on. But this is our unit of, of things coming up and down. And so our applications will generally have a top level supervisor that's going to make sure that everything down below gets watched and brought back if it needs to be brought back. We might have a supervisor at this top level that's supervising a gen server. Maybe it's also supervising another supervisor. So if that supervisor crashes, it'll be able to bring the supervisor back. And this supervisor might be watching a whole series of gen servers over here. And we can have different strategies on how these things live. So it might be if one of these crashes, we're going to kill all of its siblings. All of them go down. Or maybe it's just we just bring that one back on. And so there are different strategies you can hook in into your supervisors. So in, in Elixir, we code the happy path. So we don't code all the edges. We code the happy path. This same concept with a less manager-friendly marketing-like phrase was let it crash in the Erlang VM. The Elixir group, they usually say code the happy path. But it's the same exact idea. Um, this, is, this is really fun here, because this is why it's so easy, because we're coding sequentially. All this concurrency is, is nice, easy, because we're just top to bottom. Another idea in Erlang VM that's taken seriously is no masters. So over here on the left, we're going to look at if we have two components in the series that are both of three nines of reliability. So we put them in series, they actually become less reliable. And it's funny, if you go back to the Microsoft DNA architecture, that was kind of what they prescribed. It's like, we have this thing that does this job, and when you're done with this job, you need to pass it off to some other tier, and it's going to do its job, and this other tier will do its job. Well, in that point, if any of the three layers failed, you're fully down. And so really crappy advice. And so what we have over here instead is we generally have a series of peers. And we, when we do this, we get a lot better numbers out of this. We have the same reliability components. We put those in parallel. And we basically get to double our nines. So 17.5 hours versus 31 seconds is quite a difference there. Okay. Uh, let's language. Okay. So we've got this language. And super accessible language, productive language. And so the accessible part, let's look real quickly about this. So if you're new, it really is worthwhile going to the website and going to the guides and going from 1 to 22. And you'll actually know the language. You'll understand all of the parts of it. And this is unusual. Most, most languages, you cannot go to their website and learn the language. As ridiculous as it is, they've done such a great job. Um, and the meetups, you know, go there. You see these. You've got uh, meetup. Now, who here is in uh, the Bangalore, uh, Bengaluru uh, meetup for Elixir? All right, there's some in the back. Yay, awesome. OK. And the community, it's really warm. So you'll see this, uh, this sort of Ruby hug kind of thing that comes into the Erlang VM, which is really kind of fun. Uh, so you do a pull request, and you'll very likely see uh, something from Jose uh, where you get a merge thank you and a bunch of multicolored hearts. <laughs> and so it just, it just is just hilarious. You know, it's just, it's just such a great warm community. And he's a great steward of the language there. And so uh, inside of the language, again, this ecosystem is about being accessible, about being productive. We have hex, all these packages out here. And the quality of them are really good. One of the things, too, about hex packages is they don't just disappear on you. When 
uh, like your five line left pad thing, you know, it doesn't just go away on you. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we have here uh, plug, and we look over at the docs over on the, on the left here. It's just the, the quality of this, you have all these examples of the usage and so on. Really, really nice. So it gets this approachable and productive with modern tooling. Modern tooling now means the shell, the terminal. <laughs> and so, um, so inside of IEX, if we say H enum, and we uh, dot C, and we tab through, we get an autocomplete list of all of the things that uh, enum C has on it. And if we go out here and tab through again, we see help in line in the middle of IEX showing us uh, a num count and the way it works. And so here's the code that was behind uh, a num count. And what we see up at the top, this isn't just documentation. This is a doc test. And so if I come along and I'm going to do a pull request and I somehow goof up a num count, well, it won't ever get released to production because this documentation caught the problem and would fail the build. And also, if you read the docs, you know they work because, again, it passed the build. And that was stolen from Python. And so everything was, I mean, so many things stolen, stolen, stolen. It's, uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, they didn't just borrow, they stole it. And so, uh, so mix, this is stolen from line again from the closure community. Uh, uh, this replaces decades of IDEs right here. Mix, and we have this pluggable system of things where we can build out everything and we get rid of all that junky tooling uh, that we're just suffered through for two decades. And so we can scaffold out new projects. We can build docs, we can run tests, and so on. Okay, so we scaffold out a new project, we scaffold out a new fizzbuzz, we go through, it built this, we have our tests, it scaffolded out the whole deal for us, and we can say code dot, if we have Visual Studio Code, and we have a nice editor that plays nice with Elixir. So the whole tooling is just so easy and quick to go through, just beautiful. Expressive dev joy. So now we're gonna move on to pattern matching. So this is a thing that Erlang shines at and Elixir shines at. So ABC, we're going to destructure the thing on the right. We're going to take this tuple, uh, this three tuple, apple, banana, and cherry, and we're going to pattern match to the left. So B is going to be banana, okay? So we can do some more sorts of things with list. So we're going to have list. We're going to capture uh, list to the thing on the right, one, two, three. And we're going to do a pattern match off of a case expression here. We're going to say case, list, do, and we're going to try to matter, pattern match against 11, 12, 13. Okay? This is not going to match because 11 is not 1 and 12 is not 2 and so on. So this is not going to match. We're going to fall through. Is this going to match? Nope, not going to match because our list is not the same thing as a tuple, right? Three elements have the same numbers, but these are different data structures. So this is not going to match. All right? This one, is it going to match? That's going to match. All right, and we're going to capture the two to our X, okay? And this would also match if the one before it didn't match, but we're greedy and only the, the first one is going to match. And so this last one, this one would have matched the one against the one and the T would be bound to the tail, which is two and three here, okay? <clears throat> Fall on through, boink. And so this is nice. We're right in the middle of the IEX and we can do these multi-line things with case statements, really cool. Okay, digit separators. <laughs> Just pure candy. There's, there's just nothing but candy here. Uh, it wasn't needed, it's just added in and it's just nice. And there are all sorts of things in the, the Elixir community brought in like this. Uh, uh, one thing that Erlang was always just blasted for was being so horrible at strings because people didn't really understand that it wasn't called a string, <laughs> it's binaries and all. Anyway, the, the name change is the big thing, but on top of it, uh, uh, a lot of really great libraries, uh, uh, modules built up around string handling, but uh, UTF-8 all the way. And here we have a combination of two things. We have UTF-8, and we also have an if statement that behaves like anyone from a non-Erlang background would expect an if statement to behave at. You know, we have if and else. Uh, we could also have uh, just an if without the else, and we wouldn't crash <laughs> if, if the if didn't happen. So, all right, anonymous functions. So, we use a lot of anonymous functions, so there's going to be multiple ways of doing this. We're going to define this uh, uh, variable odd, question mark, idiom uh, here of question marks for Booleans. And we're going to say fn of x, so a function, anonymous function that's going to take x. It's going to pass it into remainder of x comma 2 is not equal to 0, so this is basically going to be our odd function, right? 
and we end our function. Okay, we can call that mod 5, mod 8. All right. So those, uh, we we're, we're have the shorthand syntax of being able to do the same thing with ampersand, parens, and then we, instead of having x, y, z, we'd have ampersand 1, ampersand 2, and so we just ordinarily match like that. So rem 1 gives us uh, uh, our first argument. Same exact thing here. Okay. One other uh, way of uh, hooking up functions is because we have multiple function heads in Erlang and Elixir, and we can do this inside of a, a fun as well. We can say area fn, square width, rectangle width height, circle radius here. And when we call this, we can say area, and we pass it in a square and a three, we get nine. Our width times our width, rectangle two times four, and so on. And so we've had multiple function heads here that are matching inside of the synonymous function, which is really neat. Uh, so functional programming, A goes to B. So we transform an input to an output. And that's so common that we have an operator built in uh, the pipe forward that lets us take the thing, the expression on the left, and pipe it in as the first argument to the expression on the right. And we'll see that in action here with our odd function. We'll define that. And we're going to take the numbers from 1 to 100,000. We're going to pipe them forward into a new map. So our first argument is actually our enumerable coming in. Uh, our second argument is our, uh, is our uh, an anonymous function of one or argument times 3. We're going to pipe that forward into filter. We're going to filter just for our odd. And we're going to sum those things. We get our big number here. Let's also do something a little bit different here. Instead of a num map, num filter, num sum, we're going to do stream map filter and then sum to get the same answer. So what's going on here? We have the enumerable protocol. So enumerables are like interfaces in C Sharp or Java so on, but it, it's, it's a shape and we're going to ha create an implementation around it. These two implementations, enum and stream, we can visually see what they're doing here. Enum is about batch processing. Chunk, chunk, chunk. And stream is more like a one piece flow. Okay. Okay, we're going to do some maps here really quickly. Name Brian, beardy. Well, I'm not that beardy. I don't have a bird flying out of my beard right now, so I'm going to say false. And so there's me. I'm going to say person. I can access that property through an indexer here. I can also access it through candy. This is. Elixir is full of candy like this. So we can say person.name. We can say person. We can build a new map based on this old map. And we get the, the new map back out. But if we do something like this, wake, is, wake of true, that's not a key in the old one, so it bombs. And if we really want to do that, we can go ahead and put uh, our new thing in like this. And so we get awake, true, beardy, false, name Brian. Okay, if we want a little bit more tightness than that, we have idea of structs. We're going to define a struct name, and these have defaults. So our name is blank, beardy faults. And we go through and we see our, our, uh, our code there for our def module. See our defaults. Same kind of stuff. But here, if we say bar defaults, boom. And so quite unlike JSON here, right? Because we, we get this check here. Okay, macros. So this, I almost feel bad showing this, but I'm going to go ahead and show it. <laughs> so uh, macros are dangerous, but so in, in, a, in a certain funny way. So result equal fridge check. So we're going to call off into the fridge, and we're going to get our temperatures. So 34, these are all Fahrenheit. Sorry, I forgot to convert those. Uh, so this is cold, but not super cold. Uh, so above freezing. So, uh, so fridge check, we get our OK and our list of things, and we're going to take that result, and we're going to get the maximum temperature for our readings, and boom. Our protocol enumerable not implemented for OK list. And it's like, it's like OK, the OK is there. And so this is the idiom of tagging a tuple. And our tag tuple came back with OK. We got our results, but we had our list, and we popped this through. And so we're going to whine and say, well, we could be grown-ups and do it like this. We could say OK, and then capture temps and result, and then <laughs> like grown-ups then take temps and then get a new max, which is a completely reasonable thing to do. Or we could be wild skate punks and build a macro. 
And so let's build a macro. So we're going to create this thing called bang pipe. It's going to have a macro that's going to define this left forward pipe thing here, this, uh, 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 that guy. And so to get your head around what's actually happening here, I'm going to mask off some bits. So we import our bang pipe. And we're going to do a fridge check on this backboard pipe, a <laughs> new max. And what it's going to do, we've got, we're into the body of this thing, the uh, unquote left, and we pipe forward, and we pipe forward into unquote right. And so what is this? We're going to replace, this unquote is going to replace that with fridge check, because it's the expression on the left. It's going to take the fridge check, it's going to pipe into this case statement here. If it matches against OK value, we're going to get the value. If it, just, if it didn't have an OK, we're just going to return the value. And we're going to then pipe that forward into the expression on the right, which is a new max. And we get our value. OK, this is really a bad idea. So don't do this. But I just wanted to, this is a uh, silly example that lets you show the power of macros and how they can change the language. And a lot of Elixir is macros. So there's some guidance on when you write macros. So you write macros when you're Jose. You can also write macros when Jose asks you to fly his sleigh tonight. And then you can also, uh, when, when you realize that, the, that not having the macro is going to make your team more miserable than having the macro, it's like, does it carry its weight is really the thing. And wow, OK, all right, this happens. <laughs> uh, and I am, uh, I need to find my mouse. Ah, my mouse. Uh, we're gonna have to skip through this pattern matching. So I'll put this into the. Uh, I'll put this into uh, uh, talk for tomorrow. So, okay. So that was more than a belly full because we're out of time. Uh, so um, we're past our belly full limit, and that's after lunch even. And so the closing here is really looking at these guys on the left, and just being thankful for this VM and this, this stack that they built, OTP that they built. Because it was built in a special time. This isn't going to get built again. Google's not off building the Erlang VM. Microsoft's not going to build the Erlang VM. The Erlang VM is out there. And it's the one that's going to be out there. And if you want this stuff, it's the place to be. And on the right, a lot of thanks to Jose for having the wisdom to see what was here. And then having the compassion to bring this whole community of really bright people along with him. And so the Erlang community is really thankful to have that. The Elixir people are thankful to have that. And so it's, it's a group of a lot of people that are thankful. And at this spot, I'd say, you know, we've got this great stack. We've got this great language. So go off and use it in your work and have fun and build good software. And, uh, and with that, we're out of time. But uh, so, uh, so thank you all. And uh, hit me with questions uh, on Twitter and uh, just around the conference. But thank you all for being here.